Welcome to Shelter Cove Online. We are so glad that you're joining us today for this sermon. We hope and pray that this message encourages you, that you learn something, that you enjoy it. But more than that, we just pray that God would move in your life, that he would reveal some more of himself to you today. If you would like to respond to this message in any way, you can contact us at sheltercovelive.com or send us a text message at 209-340-3115. Have an amazing rest of your day. Uh, Well, good morning, everybody. If you have your Bibles, grab them. Open up with me to Galatians chapter 6. I do hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. While you're turning to Galatians uh, 6, let me introduce myself. My name's Chad. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Shelter Cove. Uh, If you're a little bit newer here to Shelter Cove, I want to say welcome, and I also want to try to catch you up with where we've been going for the last couple of months. Uh, For the better portion of the fall, we've been walking through the book of Galatians, verse by by verse. Now, when I say that word book, that's kind of a misnomer because Galatians isn't really so much of a book as it is a letter. This is a letter that Paul wrote to the church of Galatia. Uh, Galatia is in the middle of what's modern day Turkey. He writes this very heartfelt, very passionate letter to correct a false ideology that had snuck into the church. Um, Here is the entire point of Galatians. Here's the whole thrust of this book. Are you ready? You are not saved by keeping the law. You're saved by faith in Christ alone. Not saved by keeping the law. Saved by faith in Christ alone. Now let me try to put that into some language that might resonate more with you. You are not saved because you're a good person. You're not saved because you are moral enough or because you obey enough of the commands of the Bible. Now, doesn't that fly in the face of what almost all the United States believes? Like, go out and ask 100 people right now, how do you get into heaven? I bet at least 90% of them are going to say, you got to be a good person. And Paul just took five chapters to say, nope, that's not the case. You're wrong. You're believing a lie if that's what you think. You want to know why? You want to know why the law, our obedience, our morality does not get us into heaven? Can I be straight with you? Your morality sucks. (laughs) I chose that word specifically. Comes from the Greek word, suckios. I just made that up. That's not true. That's false. (laughs) Your morality is foul before God. Because you and I are very good at appearing righteous on the outside, all the while having wicked, ulterior, selfish motives. Do you think God is fooled by our facade of decency? Do you think he's fooled by our facade of morality? He sees right through it into the heart. And here's the deal. Our outward decency, our outward morality cannot change the inclinations of the heart. This is why the law cannot save us. Rules and regulations cannot save us. The scriptures rather, and most of Galatians, Paul's trying to say faith in Jesus. That's what saves us. Now, I got to be real clear on what that means. Because I could say faith in Jesus and and have an idea of what that means, but you might have a completely different idea of what that means. Faith in Jesus has layers to it, two layers in particular. Faith starts by believing in your mind, intellectually knowing proper doctrine about Jesus. So here's what I mean. We believe Jesus is fully God and fully man. Jesus is not an angel. He is not some junior varsity version of God. He's not some errand boy of God. Fully God. And in the greatest act of humility, took on human form to become the substitutionary sacrifice for our sin. I've got bad news for you. You and I are sinners. You and I, all of us, at one point or another, we have thought and we have acted like we're smarter than God. With the very brains and the very bodies, the very lungs that he gave us, the very heart and blood that he gave us, we use those gifts to curse him and belittle him and say, I know how life works better than you. 
I got a C in algebra, but I know how the cosmos and I know how morality, I know how the universe works better. It's treason, it's blasphemy, it's rebellion, and it's deserving of judgment. So you have two options. You can pay the judgment or you can appeal to the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. You can appeal to the shed blood that was poured out for you, for me. And here's the wonderful truth about the shed blood of Christ. It cleanses us from all our sin. How many sins? All of our sins. That means your past sin, your present sin, and sin to come. This is why Colossians 1 will say, for those that are in Christ, they're seen as holy, blameless, and above reproach. Did you just hear what I said? How mind-boggling is that? That's mind-boggling to me because I know what a sinner I am. And yet, I would be considered holy, blameless, above reproach? Like, that means nobody can condemn me. This is what Christ did on the cross. So, we believe that. We have to have that right doctrine. But that doctrine can't stay in our heads. If it stays compartmentalized in our brain, you have fallen victim to one of the greatest tactics of the enemy, self-deceit. Tricking yourself because you think you know what's right, that counts as actual heart change. That doctrine's gotta stay in the brain and then start to slowly leak down into the heart and start to change what the heart hopes in. Change what the soul hopes in. Like the way I've always described this up here is, what, what is your soul betting on for salvation? What's your functional savior? Like, are, are you thinking if you can just make more money, that'll fix all your problems? Are, are you feeling like, man, if I could just have a better job, if I could just get married, if I can smoke enough pot, if I can get enough accolades at work, if I can achieve enough, if I can have enough sex, if I can do all these things, that will save me and fix me? Good luck. Rather, has the truth of what Christ is and what he's done, is that starting to sink into the soul? And is the soul starting to go, no, no, no. I'm moving all the chips in on Jesus. I am betting that he alone will save me. I have no contingency plan. I got no plan B for salvation. I'm not hedging my bets in any way for salvation. All the chips are in on Christ. Either he saves me or nothing is going to save me. That's faith. Knowing what's right about him, but then letting that change the soul. The soul has to start hoping. I'm betting on him. I'm banking on him. Now, here's why the Galatian church had a hard time with this. It's probably the same reason you're having a hard time with it. They struggled with this kind of gospel message because they started thinking, if we're not saved by our righteous acts, well, why does the Bible call us to behave righteously? Are you feeling that tension? You should be. Paul answers this question masterfully in Galatians 5. What he builds out in Galatians 5 is a theology of the Holy Spirit because here's what he teaches us. Not only are Christians pardoned completely from their sin, they are now indwelt by the very presence of God. The same power that resurrected Christ from the dead now lives in us. And the the word picture that he uses, it's like a tree that bears fruit. Like a healthy apple tree cannot help but just bear apples. It just does. And he says, for those who have the spirit in them, the spirit starts to produce fruit. And here's what it looks like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Like, I don't know about you. When I hear that list, I'm like, yeah, I, I, I need and want more of all of that. And Paul's, Paul's whole point is you don't manufacture that by yourself. You don't try and create that by yourself. You're the problem. Your sinful nature is in the way. Your job is to surrender more to the Spirit, is to go more and more to the Spirit and let Him create love in you and let Him create joy in you, on and on and on. Like, how miserable is it to try and do what the Scriptures command 
when you don't have the power and the motivation to do it. I can remember trying to follow this book for years and years, failing constantly. And I remember when I first learned about what the Spirit really does. The Spirit creates new cravings, new desires in us. It was mind-blowing to me. It was so freeing and liberating. Like, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you know how hypocritical and double-minded I am. Thank you that you know how weak I am to live out what you've called me to. That's what Paul is explaining. No, no, you have a power from on high to walk in righteousness. And this power is going to teach you you're not meant for rebellion. Like, do you know that? You're not designed to rebel against your maker. That's why when you do, it never fulfills you. That's why when you do, it feels good short-term and it always creates long-term destruction. You're not meant for it. You are designed, look at me, look right at me. You flourish when you obey God. You're meant for that, you're designed for that, you're built for that. Your joy and your satisfaction is at its apex when you walk in obedience to the scriptures. And God has given you a power on high to do it. That's what Paul's talking about. Now, that's my not very short summary of what we've covered in Galatians so far. (laughs) Chapter 5 ends, if we're filled with the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. If we're filled, let's keep in step with Him. The Spirit's going to lead us somewhere. It's our job to walk with Him. It's our job to reach up, grab onto His hand and go, "Let's, let's ride, let's go. And in chapter six, he's gonna explain some practical ways the spirit-filled life takes shape. Let me pray and we'll jump into chapter six. God, we need you. Speak to us now. Spirit of God, I pray you would open our eyes and hearts to see your word. And I pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen. Grab your Bibles. Let's go Galatians six, verse one, and then I'll show you the first point in your notes. Here's how verse one reads. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So here's the first characteristic of the spirit-filled life. It it looks like us gently encouraging each other in holiness. The spirit is going to compel the body of believers to mutually encourage, mutually edify each other. Now, here's what's implied in this text. Nobody in here only does encouraging. Nobody in here is in a position where they only encourage. There will be seasons where you do the encouraging, but then there will also be seasons where you need to be encouraged. There will be seasons where your soul is dry, where your soul is flat. And and you'll need a brother or sister to come alongside and, and encourage, spur you on. What, it, what the text is speaking here about is a runner who's running a race and, and they get caught by sin. This isn't speaking about a hardened, unrepentant sinner. There's a whole nother course of action for people who hear the word of God and they go, yeah, I know what it's saying, I don't care. A whole nother course of action we take. This is speaking about someone who loves the Lord, has been walking with the Lord. But like us all, man, man sometimes we fall. Not sometimes, all the time. Oh, you're going to look at me like that's not you? (laughs) We fall. We sin. And Paul goes, listen, man, you guys got to have each other's backs. Support each other. He uses this word restore. It's the Greek word katarizo. It it means to set a broken bone. I thought that was such a cool word picture. This brother, this sister that falls into sin, you, you don't beat them up. You don't take that broken bone and, and mangle it around. You, you real gently, you real carefully with a lot of tenderness, you reset it. This isn't a hard concept to grasp. What is harder is like how to actually do it, how to actually put that into action. Um, so on the one hand, what, what will usually happen is you might have a brother or sister come to you and, and they say, man, this sin I thought I had killed, it, it came back into my life. Um, and I just need to air it out. I need to talk with someone. Uh, here's a good response on your behalf. Avoid the temptation to get preachy. Listen, ask some good questions, and affirm. I think to affirm them, brother, sister, thank you for having the courage to air that out. Thank you for having the courage to face this head on. 
And then here's a question I always love to ask. How can I serve you best? How can I help you best in this? I'm certainly going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you in just a little bit. I want to pray for you. Is there anything else I can practically do to help you? The other way that this will take shape, you'll see a a close friend, a, a brother or a sister, and you'll start to see in their life a pattern of sin, and your conscience will be provoked. You'll be like, man, they... That was a little sketch the way they were doing that. That's a little sketch the way they were saying that. I don't think they should be saying that. This is far trickier. We need to be real careful how we approach these conversations. Three questions. It's not in your notes, just bonus points here. Three questions to ask before you dive into that conversation. Uh, Do I really uh, know this person deeply? Like, am I a good friend? Or am I just an acquaintance? Because here's what doesn't go well. If you're just an acquaintance and you show up, you're like, hey, I've noticed you're sinning a lot. Like, bro, you don't even know me. I got five sins right here ready for you. (laughs) But if there's relationship, if there's credibility, if there's trust, hey, man, we've walked life together for years. I, I, I know you love me. I know you're for me. Those conversations tend to go better. Second question I would have you ask, have I prayed enough about this? Have I sought the Lord? You need to bathe those kind of conversations in a lot of prayer. And then third, am I motivated by love or am I motivated by self-righteousness? Do I really care about them? Do I really want to see them restored? Or is there a part of me that just kind of wants to catch them and get them? Spirit-filled life, it'll look like us encouraging each other in holiness. Let me jump into verse 2 and 3, and then I'll, I'll give you the next point. Actually, we'll just, we'll just do, yeah, we'll do 2 and 3. Here's what it says. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. The second characteristic of being filled with the Spirit, it, it means we are sharing one another's burdens. David Guzik, who's a Bible commentator and, uh, and pastor, says this is one of the easiest commands in the Bible. Find a burden, help bear it. That's it. You don't need big programs. You don't need lots of money. You don't need infrastructure built around it, especially within the family of God. Find a burden someone has and help them bear it. And then there's a little jab. I don't know if you saw the little jab Paul sticks in here because the Galatian church was so caught up with keeping the law, keeping moral regulations. He goes, you want to really fulfill the law of Christ? The law of Christ is loving God and loving people. How you practically love people is not just an emotive feeling. It's not just saying that you're supposed to love people. You want to know how you practically do it? You find burdens that they have and you help them carry it. So that might look like financial support. That might look like uh, helping someone move. That might look like sitting down with someone, buying them lunch, and just go, man, I miss you. How are you doing? I haven't seen you around because they've been in a hard season. They've been lonely. There may be a death in the family, and, and they've just kind of withdrawn. Right? This can take shape in all kinds of different ways. Find a burden, help bear it. I want to show you these next verses here, and then I'll give you the third point. Four and five. Let's read this together. It says, but let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each one will have to bear his own load. Here's the third uh, characteristic of the spiritual life. It, It means us carefully examining our own lives. The Spirit will develop in us an ethic of examining our own lives. This verse is kind of tricky in the English. I don't, on like first pass, it was a little bit hard for me to understand what Paul is talking about. He says, let everyone test their own work. That means examine not only what you're doing, but examine the motivations behind what you're doing. Because once again, it's not a win for you to do the right thing the wrong way. You follow me on that? It's not a win for you to do moral acts, but your heart is in a completely wicked place. So we want to examine what's happening in my soul, what's happening in my mind. We want to kind of test ourselves. 
Self-reflection is an ethic that, that the spirit-filled man or woman should be regularly doing. Not one and done. This is a, a habitual act through our lives. And then Paul says, so that you can boast in yourself alone. Doesn't that feel a little sinful? Like when you hear that, isn't there a part of you that's like, oh, I don't think we're supposed to boast in ourselves. Why would Paul say that? What he's saying is not a proud, arrogant boasting, like, look at me, I'm awesome. In that self-examination, what should happen is like a humble confidence that you've done the soul level work between you and God. There's a, there's a confidence, a real humble, gentle confidence that comes from knowing I'm not perfect, but I'm in a good spot with the Lord. I'm in a healthy spot with the Lord right now. Paul goes, I want you to boast in that. I don't want you to boast. Here's what he says next. I don't want you to boast in your neighbor. And what he means by that is, I don't want you to take confidence in the fact that you're not struggling like your neighbor. He's tying it back to verse one. When somebody shares with you they got caught by sin, don't get puffed up about it that you didn't get caught by that sin. Take confidence that I'm right with the Lord, not well, at least I'm not struggling like Bill over here. I don't know if there is a Bill over here. If there is, I'm sorry. <laughs> Some guy Bill is getting elbowed by his wife. What's he talking about? You see what I'm saying? Because now watch what Paul says next. Verse five, he says, because all of us will have to bear our own load. Do you see that? Now, when I read that, I go, wait a minute. What about verse two? You just told us to bear all of our burdens, like to bear each other's burdens. And now you're saying we have to bear our own load? Do we have a contradiction here? What's going on? Make up your mind, Paul. Here's what he's talking about. Back in verse two, the word that's used for burden is like a, a life circumstance that's too heavy for you to carry on your own. In verse five, what he's talking about, that word load is, is a picture of a backpack something that we're capable of carrying. Verse five here is an indirect verse that speaks about the judgment seat of Christ. It speaks about how we are accountable for our walk with the Lord, how we steward the gospel and the Holy Spirit. Now, people get weirded out when you talk about the judgment seat of Christ. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion around this. Let me try to clear this up for you. 2 Corinthians 5, Romans 14, those are two of the main passages we have about the judgment seat of Christ. And what those texts say is that all of us, we are going to appear before what's called the Bema seat of Christ. That's what you'll hear theologians call it, the Bema seat. Bema is a word that refers to Roman like Olympic games. There would be an official that sits on what's called the Bema seat, and they would award athletes for their achievements. Now, Romans 14 says we will appear before this Bema seat, this award seat, but we will give an account for our lives. And this is where people get sketched out. Here's what's not on the table. What's not on the table when we appear before Jesus is our salvation. Our salvation is settled, amen? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sin has been cast as far away as the east is from the west. So it's not like Jesus is going to cross-examine and go, hey, are you really in? When we appear before the Bema seat, salvation's been settled. Here's what he is going to deal with. When you came to know me and the gospel took root in your life, what did you do with it afterwards? What did you do with it? How did you steward the gifts that I gave you? How did you steward the time that I gave you? 1 Corinthians 3 paints a really interesting picture. Track with me on this. Paul describes it as the day when we appear before Jesus. And he says, our works are going to be tested by fire. And some people will build with wood, hay, and stubble. What he means by that is the works that they've done after coming to know Christ... Those works were motivated by selfishness. Those works were motivated by appearing good. Those works were uh, motivated by getting pats on the back and getting brownie points. That's what their motivation was. It was not motivated by the spirit and it was not motivated for the glory of God. They were doing the right things, but they had selfish motives for it. And he says, 
that work will be burned up. So they're still getting into heaven. They're just going to smell like smoke on the way in. On the flip side, Paul says there will be people that build with precious metals and stones. Gold, silver, rubies, diamonds. And those things will hold up. The fire will test those and they'll hold up. That means their work here on earth after receiving the gospel, their work was motivated by the spirit, not their own efforts. Their work was for the kingdom, not their own recognition. The cry of their life was, Jesus, you increase, I need to decrease. And what what happens is Jesus bestows reward onto them. Now, it's not like there's going to be people in heaven who have crowns and have uh, rewards and other people don't. We're not going to be walking around heaven and go, oh, I see you don't have a crown. Ah, yeah, I know what you did. (laughs) Because you want to know what the revelation makes very clear? Anyone that has any kind of honor, they take that honor and they throw it right back at the feet of Christ. Right back at the feet of Christ, because we will all be acutely aware in that day there's only one who's worthy. It's Jesus, not me, not you. This is the judgment seat of Christ. Not salvation, salvation's been handled, but Jesus rewarding his sons and daughters. What did you do with the time, the talents, the treasures? What did you do with the gospel? Kind of a sobering passage. Let me jump here into verse six. And we'll get rolling with the rest of our text here. Six, a little bit awkward for me to teach on this, but it's here and I gotta gotta share it with you. Verse six, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. So in your notes, here's how we'll say it. The spirit-filled life, well, it's characterized by us supporting those who teach us the word. By us supporting those who teach the word of God, the gospel. This feels weird to me because it kind of feels self-serving. This text just said, pay your pastors. Support, share is the word that's used. I think that's a great word. It's not compulsive. It's not mandatory. 1 Corinthians 9.14 says, if someone proclaims the gospel, they should make their living proclaiming the gospel. The error that pastors can make is by not teaching this verse or by overemphasizing this verse. I don't want to do other. I don't want to do either of those. I just want to lay it out before you. It's not just financial support. Um, this text is referring to also prayer, relational, emotional support. Uh, I work as a full-time firefighter now. I, I was here on staff for eight years, full-time ministry before that. And I'll just tell you this, the pressure of leadership that, that the ministry can put on you, that church work can put on you, unless you've done it, it's just hard to, it's hard to understand. It can be suffocating at times. And that's not to say it's harder than your job. You all have hard jobs. I, I know, I'm just, I'm just saying, ministry has unique dynamics. And so your prayer and your relational support, your emotional support, along with financial support, man, it it means the world. And you guys historically have done a great job with that. I just wanted to say thank you. And and that's really all I have to say on this. Let me jump now into verse seven. We'll go seven through 10. These once again are, are sobering words. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The fifth characteristic here is um, cultivating. It's cultivating the Spirit's work in our life. Paul very skillfully uses another word picture for us. He says, your life is like an empty plot of farmland. 
and you have two choices. You can throw seed onto that farmland that's going to grow into something. That seed will either be thrown with the intention of gratifying and satisfying the desires of the sinful flesh, or you can throw seed onto that field and it's going to grow into something and, and that seed will be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, on and on and on, all the way up to eternal life. And we sow to the flesh, it reaps corruption. That's why I told you earlier, you're not meant for rebellion. You're just not meant for it. That's why it kills you. That's why it destroys you. That's why you you keep thinking your sin's going to satisfy you and it only breaks its promise. It only leaves you more hollow than it did when you were uh, just before it. We can reap to the flesh, that'll destroy. Or we can sow, rather, to the spirit, and that will lead to eternal life. He uses another great picture in 1 Thessalonians 5 uh, about quenching the spirit. Some translations say don't extinguish the spirit. As a firefighter, that, that makes sense to my little peanut brain. I get that. Don't put out the fire of the spirit in you. Stoke it. Keep wood on the fire. Keep that thing going. That's what he's saying here. The spirit is not going to strong arm you. The spirit, the spirit wants cooperation with you. The Spirit wants to, one theologian put it like this, to dance with you. It, it's, it's you and him. I don't know how much of it's him, how much of it is you. I, I've tried to figure that out. All I know is that I, I want to do the best I can to give him as much of me as I can. And I would say this. Here, here's one of the best ways that you can spot what you're sowing. I would say what you consume into your mind, that is what gets sowed into your soul. The, the music you listen to, the images you scroll on your phone, the news that you scroll on your phone, the videos you watch, the TV that you watch, all the stuff that you read, that's sowing into your mind. That's consuming into your mind and that's going down into your heart. And that will either lead you towards the spirit or it will lead you into the flesh. I mean, is it any wonder then that we've got people who are full of fear and anxiety? They're doom scrolling on their phone for six, seven hours a day. I'm not against phones. I'm not against news. I'm not against those things. Don't hear me. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if that's all you consume, what do you expect? Let's sow towards the spirit. Let's do the spiritual practices that will keep the fire stoked. And and there's some non-negotiables for us on that. All of us will keep the fire stoked by the word of God, by prayer, and by godly community. Like those are some non-negotiables for us that will cast good seed onto the field. Now, Paul's got a final warning here. I want to read this warning to you, and then I have an important question, and we'll close our time. Verse 11, we'll read a big chunk here, chat a little, and be done. Here's what 11 says. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. Usually Paul dictated these letters and had someone else write. Here at the end, he goes, no, give me the pen. I want this to be personal. And it's theorized Paul had bad eyesight, so he had to write really big letters. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Here's all he's saying. These guys that snuck into the church and said, you need Jesus and circumcision to be saved. You need Jesus and dietary restrictions. They don't really care so much about those laws they're imposing on you. They just impose those laws onto you because they didn't want to be persecuted. Paul goes, they were scared. They don't really care about you. They don't really care about the law. They care about themselves. They were afraid of being persecuted. That's why they heap these laws onto you. Now, 14 and 15 are just colossal verses. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision but a new creation. 
And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul says, stop hassling me. Have you been beaten like I have for Jesus? You've been shipwrecked like I have for Jesus? You've been put in prison like I have for Jesus? 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Here's Paul's final warning. Outward adherence to the law does not matter. Being transformed by the spirit matters. Church, I'm going to plead with you right now. I'm going to plead with you. I'm going to bear my soul before you. If you do not hear anything else today, hear me right now. God is not interested in you becoming a slightly better version of yourself. God is not interested in you just picking up a couple of better habits. So you just become a a slightly more moral person. He's not interested in you conforming to patterns of morality. He is interested in you being completely transformed. If you think Christianity is about you just becoming slightly more decent, you're missing the point. You're completely missing it. Circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision, it doesn't matter. That's Paul's way of saying adherence to the law. It does not matter if the heart is not changed. It doesn't matter if the spirit of God is not transforming you. This is what Jesus is after. He's not after you just trying to be a slightly better version of yourself. He wants you to be radically forgiven by the cross and indwelt by his spirit. That's salvation. And how much better is that than our own way? How much better is that than us just trying to be better? When we try to just be better on our own, you know what it makes us? Hypocrites. It makes us two-faced hypocrites. That's exhausting. That's lame. It's lame coming to church pretending like you're something you're not. Football's on. You could be at home watching football right now. Like if if we're going to play a game, why are we here? How much better would it be if we came in here and said, I'm seeking radical transformation by a power outside of myself. I want that. I don't want to just try to be slightly better. I want new cravings. I want God to make my soul delight in him. I want God to make my soul hunger and thirst for righteousness. I don't want to begrudgingly follow the commands. I don't want Christianity to be a chore. Because the the scriptures say to love God with all your heart and soul and mind. I'm I'm well aware I can't do that on my own. God's going to have to make that in me. So that's what I'm after. I'm after the spirit transforming me. I'm going to the spirit on a regular basis. You need to make me something new. So here's my question to you. Are you being transformed by the spirit? That's all. That's what matters. No outward morality matters if it's void of the inward change by the spirit. Now, some of you in here, you're, yeah, brother, yes, the Spirit is transforming. I can look back on my life and see him transform me. Then join with me and go, yes, he's transforming me, but I want more. I want more of you. I want to sin less and I want to enjoy you more. And then I would guess there's some of you in here that go, no, the Spirit is not transforming me. I've been trying to do this on my own and I'm exhausted but I'm ready, but I want it. And then I bet there's some of you in here who checked out 10 minutes ago. That's okay. I was there once too. Let's pray. God, we love you and we need you. Jesus, I want to thank you. I mean, I just feel like thank you is so small. It's so insignificant to convey uh, what I feel, but Thank you so much that you would pay my penalty in spirit of the living God. Thank you. You've not left us orphaned, Lord. You've come to us. You are good to start the good work in us and finish it. 
And so teach our hearts now, Lord, how to, to draw more power from you. What an amazing source of strength we have in us. What an amazing, rejuvenating, renewing power that is within the believer. Um, it's almost too good to be true. Like I, I still can't even wrap my mind around it, God, but in, in my best feeble way I can, I, I want more transformation. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to hate sin. I want to love you. I want, to, I want to genuinely be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. I want to love righteousness. I want to enjoy it. And I want to be repulsed by sin. But God, I know myself. I know I'm prone to wander. God, I know I'm like a dog that goes back to its vomit. I know uh, that's in me. So I'm pleading with you, God, change. I want to give you more of myself. And for my brothers that feel the same way, for my sisters that feel the same way, I pray that for them. And for those in here, God, that go, man, I, I want the spirit. I need forgiveness and I need the spirit. I want to start that today. Here's how I would lead you. You have to go before the Lord yourself. You, you've got to go do that yourself. I can't do it for you. But it's real simple. Jesus is so faithful to take even the smallest little inkling of faith and turn it into something big. You go to him right where you are in the quiet of your heart and mind and just say, Jesus, forgive me. Wipe the slate clean, spirit, and the best way I know how, I invite you in. I want transformation. I'm sick of trying to do this on my own. Make me something new. I want new desires. I want new cravings. Help me. Thank you for this great book. May we live up to the identity you have already given us. May we access more and more of your spirit, be more in step with him, more filled with him. Pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen.